Coming up on DTNS, Europe may stop Google from acquiring Fitbit. Apple updates the iMac, and Amber Mac is here to tell us about robots that make for happier cows. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, August 4th, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Sarah Lane has the day off, but tech expert Amber Mack is here. Welcome, Amber. Good to have you back. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Uh, we were just having a good conversation with Amber about uh, schooling from home, about the future of conferences with virtual events. If you want that expanded conversation, become a member and get good day internet at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. You may see headlines about this, so I'm going to mention it. Apple told The Verge directly there are no talks at present for Apple to acquire TikTok, and it has no plans to pursue such a deal. The statement came in response to an Axios report that sources outside of Apple had told Axios that Apple was interested. Apple says no, we're not. Microsoft announced it will launch Project xCloud on September 15th on Android devices. Project xCloud will be bundled as part of the Xbox Game Pass Ultimate subscription. That costs you 15 bucks a month with more than 100 games available on Android tablets and phones. Apple's Phil Schiller is stepping down as marketing chief, taking on the role of Apple Fellow. He will remain in charge of the App Store and Apple events and continue to report to CEO Tim Cook. Greg Joswiak, Jaws, will take over as SVP of Worldwide Marketing for Apple. President of the United States withdrew his renomination of Republican FCC Commissioner Michael O'Reilly Monday. O'Reilly had been submitted for renomination in March and was awaiting Senate approval. O'Reilly recently spoke out against efforts to limit protections offered to social media companies by Section 230 Safe Harbor. The president has petitioned the FCC to reinterpret those protections. O'Reilly clarified that his critiques are not directed at the president. Doesn't look like he's going to be an FCC commissioner. Google is finally in the last stage of shutting down Google Play Music. Pour a little out. Uh, YouTube Music is now the replacement. You can move all your stuff over there. Last month, Google enabled a really easy ability to migrate your library from Play Music to YouTube. Later this month, Google will shut off Music Manager, the, the way you upload and download stuff, and purchases. Streaming will shut down in October. And then Google Music and the app and website will go away in October as well. In December, any music left in your account will be deleted. Uh, so if you want to use the Google uh, data transfer service, you have until December to get it out that way. But after December, it's going to be just gone from your account. And Twitter alerted investors that the Federal Trade Commission might find it up to $250 million for violation of a 2011 consent decree. Between 2013 and 2019, Twitter says an error caused it to target ads based on phone numbers and email addresses provided for safety and security purposes. The FTC is saying, we don't care if it's an error. I think we're going to fine you anyway. All right. Let's talk a little more about uh, some new Apple products. Apple updated its 27-inch iMac to include 10th Gen Comet Lake processors. You have options from six cores up to a 10-core i9. Uh, the model also now offers GPU choices. You can get the 5300 XT from AMD, the 5500 XT with 8 gigabytes of VRAM, or a 5700 XT with 16 gigabytes of VRAM. Uh, speaking of RAM, you can also start all your iMacs with 16 gigs or pay to upgrade it to 128 of DDR4. Solid state drives are now standard with a base of 256 gigabytes, up to 8 terabytes solid state on everything. Uh, the 27-inch iMac also now includes the T2 security chip, a 10-gigabyte Ethernet port, and the webcam got upgraded to 1080p. And the mics are now the same studio-quality microphones you find in the 16-inch MacBook, two on the chin, one on the back. The display now comes with True Tone for more natural color and an option for you to pay for a nano texture, which is essentially the matte option. The 27-inch iMac didn't get a price change either. All these changes still start at $1,799, available now. And the solid-state drive across the line was applied to the 21.5-inch iMac as well, which also still starts at $1,099. Any of this make you want to run out and buy a new iMac, Amber? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the interesting things here is when you talk about the studio quality microphones and also the web camera and improvements there, it just reminds me of how many people are going to be working from home over the course of the next six months to a year, maybe even beyond that. And I think how much more important that particular feature will be for people who maybe didn't think much about it previously. 
And if you're wondering out there, ARM silicone, what about what about Apple silicon? Uh, that is going to come eventually. But Apple had said they would still have Intel based models in the channel. And this is one of them. So these are Intel based iMac updates. Uh, it, it's funny to me, I, the, the tech press couldn't seem to make up their mind whether this was a minor spec upgrade or a major upgrade. It kind of depended on which headline you, re you read. Do you, do you fall on one side or the other there? Uh, I, I feel like it's minor. I mean, really, if you look at uh, the new iMac, I, I just feel like I, I also think we're in a time right now where I don't feel as though people are paying as much attention to these types of updates because there are bigger things to think about. So I think that diminishes a little bit of the excitement around technology news where uh, maybe we'd be impressed in the past. Uh, we're a little jaded these days. Yeah, yeah. You either you need to buy it for your work from home situation or not, right? It's it, it's not a as much of a discretionary purchase. Uh, WhatsApp announced a feature to help you search the web for information about frequently forwarded information. Frequently forwarded information often uh, leads to disinformation. A message forwarded more than five times already includes a little double arrow on it to let you know, hey, this is getting spread around a lot. It will also now have a magnifying glass icon on it. When you click on that magnifying glass icon, it'll open news results or other info related to the content in the message. Uh, the feature is being rolled out in Brazil, Italy, Ireland, Mexico, Spain, the UK, and the US. What's interesting about this to me, Amber, is that WhatsApp is end-to-end -end encrypted, so they can't see what the message is. There has to be an algorithm acting locally to guess what's in the message and provide <laughs> that link. And I wonder how good that is. Yeah, I mean, that's going to make a lot of people who are concerned about privacy and who value encryption a little bit nervous. I would also go one step further. I think one of the things that's been a little bit discouraging, I think, when we look at the ecosystem of uh, Facebook platforms and apps is they tend to roll out uh, different features for different platforms where a lot of these features would be great across the board, right? I mean, I think on Facebook, if you look at its shares and how content is being shared, I mean, it would would be great to see something similar on the Facebook platform. Uh, they do the same thing with Instagram. I would argue that some of the anti-bullying features they have on Instagram to uh, allow you to kind of uh, block people and not let them know that they're blocked, those would be valuable over on Facebook. But they don't seem to share some of the knowledge uh, that they have around improving those platforms, whether it's for privacy uh, or security, or even just to stop the spread of misinformation and disinformation. Yeah, it, it, is, it is a revealing fact isn't it about the fact that these are different teams with different product roadmaps, you know, as much as we think of it as Facebook, uh, I'm sure the people at WhatsApp are like, yeah, uh, it would be great to put that anti-bullying feature in, but we have, you know, this list of priorities that our manager <laughs> gave us. Uh, and, and it would take someone unifying the product up at the top to, to sort of coordinate that. But I, I think you're absolutely right. It would be nice to see this magnifying glass type thing show up on Facebook, show up on Instagram, uh, at least the concept of it, even if it's implemented slightly differently. Yeah, and it just makes me a little bit nervous that uh, they wouldn't do that, right? I mean, because it, it makes me think is that many of the things that you hear about Facebook as a platform in terms of, of how they're making an enormous amount of money are, in fact, because all of this information is shared so readily and so many times among people, even if it is misinformation or disinformation, the algorithms kind of push that to the top like they would on YouTube or other platforms. So uh, that it just feels to me, it just it's something that just doesn't sit right. You know, it made me think when you were when you were talking about this, and I hadn't thought about this before, the one difference is Facebook can see your message. So they can actually do more than just a magnifying glass icon. They can put an actual label. They can put fact checking, et cetera. Uh, so maybe that's maybe that's part of the difference here. I don't know. Just, yeah, I mean, it, it's a great question if we get a chance to ask them one day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Sony reported a 53% increase in net income last quarter, beating estimates for operating profits. So I uh, occasionally tongue-in-cheek call Sony an image sensor company, but it's not true this quarter. Video games led the way, with revenue up 33% to $5.6 billion in the video game sector of Sony, led by The Last of Us Part II, which saw 4 million units in its first three days. I think that's the biggest selling first-party 
uh, game in three days that they've ever had. Ghosts of Tsushima also uh, sold 2.4 million units in its first three days, but that released after the quarter was over. So its sales will be reflected on the next quarter's results, but it does bode well for that. Uh, PS Plus subscribers rose 3.4 million to 44.9 million. Sony forecasts that its image sensor business which usually is its strongest division, as I said, will see operating profit for the year fall because of weaker demand for high-end smartphones. They said it'll eventually bounce back, but this year is going to see a bit of a dip. And you might think movies would be a soft spot for Sony too. And yes, theatrical revenue fell to $6 million. Think about that. Like one movie usually makes $100 billion. So Theatrical revenue for Sony Pictures Entertainment last quarter was $6 million, but home entertainment revenue rose 60% to $319 million. Uh, the growth, along with reduced advertising expenses, because they didn't have to spend a bunch of money putting trailers in front of sports games and stuff, led Sony Pictures to have its first profit in this quarter in five years. Now, it usually is profitable in the December quarter when all the blockbusters come out, but this is the quarter where it usually loses money uh, and the rest of the year makes up for it. I, I found that fascinating that when they stopped putting out movies, they had a more profitable quarter in the spring. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's so interesting. I mean, and to go back to your comments about the uh, image sensors, uh, what was fascinating to me is though, even though we saw uh, the actual profits drop, uh, I didn't realize when I was reading this in Forbes that uh, Sony continues to dominate the image sensor industry, accounting for more than 50% of global sales. And a lot of that is because of the computer vision technology built into these sensors. So basically our, our cameras have brains and it totally makes sense that if you look at the premium smartphones that are being sold right now, those numbers are coming down because uh, even just today, Google announced a, a, a new, or yesterday, a budget-friendly smartphone uh, well under $1,000. So we are seeing this movement happen right now with the smartphones where the prices are coming down. Yeah, and Sony said in its earnings call, like, for the next year, we're going to have to readjust to marketing our sensors to the mid-range, to that Pixel 4a kind of kind of crowd. Yeah, absolutely. It makes sense, right? And and yeah. I, I think we're going to, you know, once people get comfortable with that price point, I mean, I think it's going to be hard for some of these smartphone makers to actually uh, hike the price up again. The European Commission launched an investigation into Google's proposed acquisition of Fitbit Tuesday. If you remember, Google agreed to acquire Fitbit back in November. They've been waiting on regulatory approval. That's fairly normal. Google promised to the European Commission it will not use Fitbit's users' health and wellness data to target ads, and instead keep that data siloed off from other Google data sets. And you'd think, oh, well, okay, that then that should make everyone rest easy if they believe Google, but it wasn't enough. The commission said that the silo that Google talked about to them didn't cover all the data it would get through the acquisition, and that's a problem. Remember, they said health and wellness data. There's other data, metadata, IP addresses, et cetera. Even non-health data like that in the European Commission's opinion, would increase Google's advantage at personalization and targeting over competitors. And what Europe is worried about here is, will this acquisition not just give Google a look at your health data, but will it help them drive out competitors? And even if they don't use the health and wellness data, EC saying maybe it would. Google posted Tuesday that this deal is about devices, not data. And I'm pretending like the EC responded to that. They said this before Google said that. But uh, in addition to the concerns about the acquisition's effect on advertising, the EC is also investigating whether Google would have, quote, the ability and incentive to degrade interoperability of computing wearables on Android, uh, health wearables on Android. So the EC is saying, yes, it is also about devices. We're worried about you cutting off access to withings and, and other things like that. The commission has 90 working days to investigate the acquisition, uh, making December 9th, 2020, the latest that it could decide. This is not an antitrust investigation the way you think of them investigating and then finding them. This is an, uh, uh, an acquisition investigation to prevent an antitrust situation. Uh, are, do you, you fall on one side or the other here, Amber? Yeah. 
I would just say that I'm glad that the European Commission is having this conversation right now because the, the wearables market is something that I've been paying a lot of attention to, especially during COVID-19. You know, we've seen new wearables on the market, such as the Aura rings that the NBA is using. Uh, we see the Whoop band, which I'm wearing right now. What's interesting about these is the ability to measure things such as uh, respiratory rate uh, and also your heart rate variable variables. And you see that many of those can be early signs in terms of uh, COVID-19 symptoms. And we are in early days of actually making that connection, but we're starting to see that. So I expect uh, when it comes to the wearables market, knowing that wearables can help so much in this fight against COVID-19, the next six months, we're going to see the numbers of wearables really surge as far as sales. So it's good to, I think, to have this conversation right now around the data and the health data and, and, and see this kind of play out uh, before more and more people, I think, start wearing these wearables every single day. Yeah, and there's going to be more and more pressure on Google uh, to promise that it's going to manage data properly, to, to not be anti-competitive, to protect privacy. Alphabet owns a company called Verily that could just take over the health data part of this. Uh, Verily operates under very strict health industry situations. I feel like that would be a smart thing. Beyond that, though, if the EC is saying, yeah, but you still got the non-health data and you can still use that for ad targeting, that's a problem. I think Google, and I've heard some other people suggest this, needs to pivot into being the company that allows you to manage your data. Uh, the smartest thing in the world, in my opinion, would be for Google to go and sign up for uh, MIT's solid project that Tim Berners-Lee is leading and say, we are now going to be the company that protects that data. Because if they don't, someone else is gonna do that eventually and it's going to hurt Google. They, they could do themselves a favor and get ahead of it if they did it now. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more. And I think the days of people not caring about the privacy uh, are, are going to eventually be behind us. I mean, if we look at uh, contact tracing apps, which one just launched in Canada, a really simple privacy policy that was essentially three lines that said, we don't have any of your data. Uh, I think people are more aware about privacy now. And I think you're exactly right. Like if I had to pay a subscription to actually get access to all my data anywhere I wanted it, I mean, that could be a better way, again, to allow the user to have access to their data. Um, and not think of so much about uh, Google again, selling that data and advertising as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Google announced new features for its smart displays, speaking of Google, uh, smart displays and speakers. These features are meant for children participating in school at home. A family bell can be programmed to go off at a specified time each day. It emits a chime and speaks a message like time for school. Uh, you can also just speak to a display and something say something like start the school day and have special visuals display, have the lighting turn on in a room or, or something. Uh, maybe the blinds you know turn off. Not exactly school related is an update to the broadcast feature that lets you exclude a speaker. Uh, so if you want to send a message from one room to another, but not the whole house, you can now do that. And an animal of the day feature with sounds and tasks, uh, <laughs> which I think is for, for little kids and it sounds kind of cute. Actually. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I think the back to school season for many, many parents is going to be challenging. I mean, if you look at the past few months, uh, many parents I know have let their kids stay up much later than they're supposed to have let them play Fortnite much longer than they're supposed to. <laughs> and so getting back into those routines is really difficult. So I think these are some uh, good little features that they're launching. I do have to say that uh, the broadcast feature in terms of actually eliminating a speaker, if you don't want to broadcast everywhere in the house, if people aren't familiar with that, it's just like Tom said, you can use the broadcast feature to basically create an intercom from your Google Home uh, or Google Nest Hub or Google Nest uh, smart speakers in the home. And uh, I love the idea that you could exclude a speaker because sometimes it gets a little annoying when you're broadcasting everywhere. Yeah. Or somebody's sleeping in. You don't want to wake them <laughs> up, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. Amber, you just uh, went to a farm run by robots. Is that correct? <laughs> It absolutely is. So uh, we had a really unique opportunity to head out to a farm around about a, an hour west of Toronto. And uh, I'm sorry, you mean an hour west of Hamilton? <laughs> and I, no, no, not of Hamilton. Are you saying that? Is that a, like a funny Canadian joke that I'm not getting, Tom? I, that's a, a joke for my friends in Hamilton who try <laughs> okay. to pretend Toronto doesn't exist. <laughs> 
Okay, I was like, sure, yeah, we'll just say uh, the greater uh, Toronto area, uh, around an hour west, and uh, it's a, a dairy farm that is a fourth generation dairy farm. They, it had been entirely manual, and what was really interesting is they have switched to robots to essentially run the dairy farm uh, because they just didn't have enough hands anymore. They had people helping them who were no longer able to help. The family wanted to hold on to the farm. The only way to do it was to introduce robots. So they have a uh, a milking robot. Uh, they have a, a feed robot that kind of pushes the feed up to the cows as they're eating. Uh, also, the entire barn is high tech, so it's temperature controlled because the cows like it at a very precise temperature. So the blinds will go up and down based on the temperature. Uh, it was phenomenal. You know, I've I've done a little bit of speaking in the agriculture world in terms of ag tech, but actually putting your feet on the ground in one of these barns and seeing it firsthand was uh, really eye-opening for me. So I have so many questions. Uh, with, with, the, with the milking, uh, I know that, that you, were, you were telling me before the show that the cows can decide when they get milked. It's not like the robots are rolling around going up to the cows. Yeah, absolutely. So it's called the the Lely Astronaut. This is the milking machine that is in the middle of the barn. And uh, what's really fascinating about this is exactly what you said. Like I used to think about uh, a high tech farm and, and thinking, okay, you have to force the cows to go get milk. They would be prodded to get into their space. Uh, but actually, what happens after about a week of training the cows and, and teaching them to go to the robotic milking machine, uh, the cows understand that this is a place where they can go to get relief when they need to be milked. Uh, also, they get a little treat as well. And so the whole time we were there, which was probably around four and a half, five hours, there was a lineup of five or six cows waiting to be milked. And I kept thinking like, you know, where, where are the prods? Like who's pushing them in that direction? But they would just, they were free to roam throughout the entire barn. Uh, they all wear a little kind of like Fitbits and uh, they would just come when they wanted. And as soon as they went to get milked, uh, you would see on the screen of the uh, robotic machine that it would have their name, all their other details. So again, Again, I think it really speaks to how technology on a farm like this can be beneficial, not just to the farmers to have that extra help, but also to the cows who can potentially be healthier in that type of, type of environment. So the, 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 you said they get a little treat. Uh, I assume that that's part of the motivation uh, to go get milked. But but it is if people don't realize who didn't grow up in dairy country, uh, it's mostly about cows feeling like, you know what, I need to get milked like that. Is, that is a thing that that cows are uncomfortable when they have too much milk, right? Not not just cows, Tom. I will say as a mom who nursed, I totally understood the cows. So <laughs> uh, I, I really understood that, you know, there gets to a point if you're a nursing mom where you if there's just relief in pumping or feeding your baby. And I think what uh, used to happen in most dairy farms is that they would bring the cows together at the same time. They would milk them all at the same time. But of course, some of the cows aren't ready to be milked, right? I mean, not all women produce the same amount of milk at the same time. So it kind of makes sense when you go into that environment that the cows get that relief when they want that relief. And there's no, like you said, there's no people pushing them over there. There's no people even really like standing around monitoring it. It just sort of happens. It just sort of happens. So in the entire barn, uh, as I mentioned, they're free to roam around. So uh, they have their collars on, so they have all of the diagnostics as far as their health, but they're free to roam around, eat, go uh, to the robot machine when they want to go to the robot. There's also a robot feeder that pushes all the feed towards them. Uh, but you're right. I mean, I had a lot of misconceptions before going there. I would have thought that, you know, the cows were chained up. They were in tiny little stalls. They weren't free to roam. And what I saw with technology, again, is that I believe that the welfare of the cows is actually enhanced uh, because of this technology because no longer does a, a farmer have to come and kind of guess if the cow isn't healthy they'll get an alert on their phone because they're measuring all of those health diagnostics and, and this robot I mean it, it's really kind of a big station with some moving arms and stuff to 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 milk do the milking and everything it does not look welcoming to be honest <laughs> Well, have you ever seen a pump <laughs> in terms of a breast pump? You're right. For a woman? Those it doesn't also look welcoming look either. Welcoming. Yeah. I, I don't think there's anything sort of uh, attractive about the pumping process, whether you're a human or a cow. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I, I would say you're right. I mean, I. I think the interesting thing, again, is that the cows are coming there on their own to be milked and because it does give them that relief and because the actual pump um, will sort of measure their teats and understand because they know which cow is coming up, it starts to learn the comfort level of being pumped. Uh, you know, that's probably not going to happen with a human, right? Especially right. at 430 in the morning. Yeah, it's a, you're, you're just bleary eyed sitting on a, on a, on a with a pail. So, yeah, so yeah, pretty much. Just, 
This is definitely better. Then now we're, we're focusing on the milking here, but there was some other technology in in the operation as well. You mentioned the the trackers, the Fitbit like things on them. What is there anything else that that we missed that we should talk about? Yeah, so there was a, a feed robot. So it looks a little bit like R2-D2. This is something I never realized either, is that oftentimes if you see a cow feeding in a barn, they're sorting through all the feed because they like certain par parts of the feed better, but they're pushing a lot of it away with their noses. And so what, what has to happen in the barn is that the feed is always pushed towards them. Historically, for decades, that has actually happened manually with a farmer who comes in and pushes the feed towards the cows, you know, every couple of hours or however much they need to do it. Now there's this R2-D2 little robot that comes along and is constantly pushing the feed towards the cows. Uh, so that was a, another interesting experience. And, and the particular dairy farm we were at, uh, the woman who's a fourth generation farmer, she said her grandfather used to do that job. Uh, he left the farm. He was almost 100 years old. Uh, he's still alive. Uh, but now the robot has replaced him. And they've named the robot after the grand father knowing he has uh, assumed responsibility of that particular job he has a he has a legacy he has a robot legacy that's it's amazing <laughs> we can only uh, wish for as much as humans. yeah right that's really <laughs> cool uh, you know, I was reading about uh, some of this this kind of technology in the Columbus Dispatch, uh, and they noted that this isn't really new. It's just advancing. Somewhere between 2 and 3% of the approximately 36,000 dairy farms in the United States use automated milking systems. Uh, and Douglas J. Reineman, professor of biological systems engineering at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, said the 20-year trend in the U.S. is that the number of cows milked with robots has been doubling about every three to four years. So this is a this is an up and coming trend. Yeah, it absolutely is. And it was interesting talking to this particular woman because she had said that they used to get up at 4.30 in the morning. I already mentioned that. Now with all of the robots in the barn, they don't have to get up until about 7.30. So she was saying even for the health of the farmers who typically, I mean, it's a grueling job, right? It's very uh, physically intensive. She said even for them, they were all feeling better and healthier because of all of this technology. So I asked her, I said, you know, are you worried that this is taking jobs away from farmers? And she said, well, there's a lot of people who don't want to work on these farms, number one. And she said there's a lot of families who want to keep these farms and they're only able to really maximize uh, their production if they put these robots in place. Yeah, this is this is one where I, you know, agriculture in particular has a labor shortage. We've talked about that before on the show. And uh, while there are situations where automation does replace or push jobs into other arenas, uh, and we have to pay attention to them. This is one where it actually helps the farmer avoid being taken over by, by a larger business, uh, which, which I think is really interesting and, and really cool to look at. Also, Absolutely. up with the cows now means robots. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I, I think it was fascinating, too, just to think about the cost savings overall with some of this technology on the farm. I mean, it's a huge investment, but you can reap the benefits of that over the years. Well, uh, thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit. Uh, I know in the past you've sent us some good agricultural stories there. Keep them coming. Submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Let's check out the mailbag. Shara had a thought regarding the CAI tags with photos. Uh, did, did you hear about this? We talked about it yesterday on the show. Uh, Adobe is putting in or pushing forward, along with Twitter and the New York Times, an open source standard to use encryption to have images, have the ability to list the history so you would know whether they were uh, manipulated or not, right? Ah, it would be interesting. A, it would be a way for you to tell, like, oh, this image has been changed. I can see how it was changed. It could also just be used for authorship to say, like, this image was created by me, and nobody can change that. Uh, Shara said stock image providers like Adobe are going to love this. Stock image providers probably have a nice secondary income from people who are using their images without paying for them. If you download an image from a site and put it on your site, but Adobe actually owns the image, you get a letter saying pay them. Do you think this information is something Adobe could crawl the web for yet? This feels a bit like AWS to me, where Amazon made a thing for themselves, but now it's a product for the public. Adobe is keeping the it's really for us part quiet. Uh, yeah, I think I think the fact that this is an open source project and that they're wanting others to come on board makes me feel a little less concerned about the AWS part of that. This isn't a private business for Adobe. It's something they, they really want to make an open platform. Uh, but you're not wrong that the digital rights management aspect of this is something that not only Adobe, but Getty and, and others could, could definitely take advantage of. 
Yeah, I mean, I could see that for sure. I mean, it reminds me, uh, there is a company based here in Toronto called Tin Eye, and for many, many years, they've worked with some of these big uh, photography companies uh, that uh, allows people who are publishers to essentially take a photo that uh, they have the rights to and then match wherever else that photo has been on any website uh, to potentially uh, get in touch with the people who have used that image. So uh, I think anything that kind of protects the creative rights of uh, photography is a good thing, especially in this day and age where I think a lot of those people are hurting right now. Yeah, and if we didn't make it clear yesterday, it's optional. Uh, you don't have to put the history of the image in there. You don't have uh, to put stuff in there. It does mean that you leave it open to be mistrusted if you don't. Uh, but if you are uh, the photographer and you don't want someone to see how you created the photo or how you touched it up, uh, you don't have to do that. You don't have to add that. Uh, hey, folks, uh, Austin from the Google Accessibility Trusted User Tester Team uh, Gatut would be how you would shorten that, I guess. Uh, he got in touch with us because they're looking for volunteers in Canada to test Google products for accessibility needs. Testing like this helps the engineering teams at Google better understand accessibility needs so they can incorporate them into future product enhancements. If you're in Canada or even in the United States, but they're focusing on Canada right now, and you're 18 years or older and can provide feedback in English and are willing to have a Google account or already do, uh, head to g.co slash a11ytt, or we'll have the link in the show notes as well, and you can apply for the program. It's a way to kind of help contribute to accessibility at Google. Very cool. You know, I've been thinking so much about accessibility because we produce a, a lot of uh, online video content and, you know, I try to caption things. Sometimes we forget to caption things. And I think at the end of the day, I hope this just becomes the, the standard. And I'm happy to see companies out there like Rev that introduced that plugin for Zoom. So if you're doing a live, live Zoom uh, video conference, you can have live captioning. I know Google's been doing this for a bit, but I think Google's been at the forefront of accessibility. If you look at the, the big tech players, they seem to really be leading the way. Yeah, yeah, Google's done a lot of great things. Apple and Microsoft have also done some really good accessibility things uh, as well. I want to give them credit as, as well. But I like this idea of, of asking people to help because that, that shows that you're taking it seriously. Like we need the general public to help us test this uh, so that we don't just introduce our own in-company biases. And I, I hope more companies are doing that. Shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Ragnald Varmadal, Reed Fischler, and Paul Reese. And of course, thank you, Amber Mack, for joining us. It's great to have you. Thanks so much for having me. If folks want to find out more about what you're up to, where should they go these days? Uh, probably the best place is my email newsletter. I know that sounds old, so old school, but uh, it's ambermack.com slash newsletter. I send it out every Tuesday, no strings attached. Uh, it's uh, all about technology. I like to say technology plus uh, artificial intelligence, all the latest stories. So uh, you can sign up there. Yeah, new newsletters are so old school, they're new school again. I it's think. like podcasts, right? People yeah. ask me to do a podcast and they explain to me what it is. And I'm like, I, I did a podcast like 13 years ago. I don't know what you're yeah. talking about. <laughs> no, that's great. Uh, go check it out, folks. Amberback.com slash newsletter. Also, uh, we're asking folks, if you get a chance, even if you don't use it, to review us in the Apple Podcasts store. It helps raise the profile of the show. Uh, we, we think it has some effect on how the list goes up. You can just leave a rating. That helps. Or if you want to write a few things in there as well, that would be cool too. Uh, so if you are on iOS or macOS, it's easy. Uh, you can even go to the web and do it as well. But uh, if you're looking for a free, cheap, and easy way to help the show, uh, just go review us in the podcast app or any podcast app out there. You can also support the show directly and get some cool perks. We got a, a new security threat wire uh, about a, a bootloader vulnerability from Shannon Morrison there. Go check that out, patreon.com slash DTNS. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Scott Johnson and Sarah Lane. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>